I built a robot to clean up my workbench for me because this is what it normally looks like and I don't want to clean it myself. But this robot has to be big enough to span the full 17 feet of the workbench. While being able to execute precision moves while also being versatile enough to deal with many different types of tools. Although I've built small robots in the past, I've never made something this big and it will require tons of huge custom parts along with some very expensive components and electronics. But the biggest challenge is I can't even test it until it's fully built. So I have to stick in weeks of work and tons of money before I even know if it's gonna work. But it turns out that my desire to avoid cleaning far outweighs my sense of self-preservation. So we're doing this thing, let's go. Fortunately, building a three axis robot is a problem that's already been solved. So there's a lot of places for inspiration like in the P2S from Bamboo Lab, who is the sponsor of this video and the machine that I use to make many of the 3D printed parts for this robot. More on that later, but if we take a quick peek inside the machine, you can see that it's already capable of moving side to side. This is the X axis, front to back, the Y axis, and up and down, the Z axis, AKA the Z axis in one very specific country. So I'm basically just trying to build a 17 foot 3D printer. How hard could it be? All right, for version one, the goal is simple. Can I build a robot capable of pulling these drawers off the wall, but more importantly, putting them back? So I feel like we're gonna need one millimeter accuracy on this thing, because we're gonna need that precision for our second goal, which is tidying up the tools on the workbench. And stretch goal is to build a robot strong enough to hold my weight, because who knows what the future may hold. Let's just break it down and tackle one thing at a time, starting with the part that terrifies me the most, the X-axis. First things first, I need some big linear rails for the axis to slide on, but I can't just mount these directly to the wall because it would be impossible to mount them straight. So instead, the plan is to mount the rails to some sort of really long backplate that we could then mount to the wall. A couple problems with this plan though. One is I don't have the equipment to make a really long while also very precise backplate. The other is once we have a 17 foot linear rail backplate thingy, how the heck are we gonna mount this thing onto the wall? Future Jay's problem. For the back plates, I reached out to my friends at a company called CNC Cutting Inc. in Toronto who used their CNC routers to precisely cut them out of MDF material. They also managed to do this in less than a day to meet my crazy YouTuber timelines. So huge thanks to Chris and the team for making this happen. If you need any large panels cut, they are an incredible resource. Check them out. We decided to go with five panels at this size so they could fit onto two full sheets of MDF as well as fit into my car. We laid out all the panels and it was starting to become clear that problem two, mounting this stuff to the wall, was gonna be a lot of fun. But before getting to that, it was time to start screwing the rails into the plates. One thing about buying really cheap linear motion components, there's a good chance that they're gonna be warped, which may or may not present a problem when you're trying to butt them up to one another. Also, this may affect the goal of one millimeter accuracy, but that was kind of a pipe dream anyways. The new goal is 10 millimeter accuracy with some hope that I'll be pleasantly surprised when it's better than that. I'm optimistic, but honestly, it's hard to know what to expect because I've never built anything this big before. I don't have much intuition for how materials this scale will flex and warp and whatever. So we're on this learning journey together, but yeah, still optimistic. While I'm acting as the world's most complicated organic clamping system, my dad and Mark were doing the hard work of drilling and screwing the rails into the MDF panels. Everyone has a job and every job is important. I'm a clamp. By the way, everyone say what up to Mark. He's been helping me out with the engineering process for the past couple months. Hi Mark. Okay, the six rails are mounted and after mounting the sliding gantry plate to the sliders, obviously you gotta test it for strength. <laughs> it's so sick, oh! Also, Mark gave it a rip too. So at the very least, we can confirm that the slider is strong. And maybe this was really just procrastination for the part where you have to lift this thing up onto the wall. But don't worry, we actually have a plan for that. Mark put his life on the line to rig some ropes in around the ceiling trusses. And after lifting the panel onto the workbench, we were able to hoist the panel up onto the wall with my dad supporting in the middle. If this looks like it went up really easily, well, it actually did go up way more easily than I ever could have expected. The old saying about five minutes of planning can save you an hour of execution is actually true. Who would have thought? And after securing the place to the wall with some concrete anchors, we have ourselves a 17 foot gantry. Wow. Hold on, I'm gonna bring you guys up here. You can get a closer look, hold on. I hope you're not afraid of heights. Okay, I'm gonna put you over here. Let's not drop the camera. This is crazy. This is literally the biggest thing I've ever built. But there's still so much to do. Like we gotta get the rack pieces, the Y axis, the Z axis. Gotta put the motors, drag chains, electronics, figure out how to code this thing, see if it's, even gonna work. It's kind of a crazy thing to get to this point. I've sunken so much money into this project already. And like, I still don't really know what to expect. I don't know exactly how it's gonna work or whatever. It's kind of crazy to think like, when you go out to build a bridge, 
the amount of money you got to sink into it before you know if the bridge is going to hold some things up. I guess that's what engineering was designed for, isn't it? So hopefully the engineering process is going to work on this project. <laughs> it's not a bridge, but I don't know. One way to find out, and that is to just keep going. Let's do it. Bye. Like most 3D printers, the P2S uses belts to move the X-axis. But over a 17-foot span, they could potentially stretch and lose accuracy. So we decided to switch to a rack and pinion system instead which means that it's officially time to fire up the printers and start cranking out some parts for this thing. I've decided to go with Black Bamboo Lab PLA because when paired with the AMS2, it prints absolutely perfectly on the P2S. I think using a high quality PLA is gonna be more than sufficient for this build because the machine won't be lifting anything heavy enough or moving fast enough to stress the parts beyond their structural limits. Also, everything is gonna be printed super chonky. So the automatic filament switch on the AMS2 is absolutely necessary to make sure that we don't run out of any filament halfway through one of the prints. The first set of parts are the 25 rack segments, and you can see that we have some beautiful prints. The helical rack slot into these spaces in the MDF back panel and then screw into place. Having such a specific rack position, along with the helical tooth profile, is meant to reduce backlash, which is the amount of wiggle a gear has. This can affect the accuracy of the machine when it moves across the full span, so anything that we can do to eliminate that will be really helpful later. We oriented the rack teeth downward to hopefully prevent dust from accumulating on the teeth and interfering with the machine's accuracy as well. Quick test to see how the pinion rolls on the rack. Beautiful. Okay, now it's time to get real printy because the Y and Z axes need a ton of parts. Everything is printed at eight perimeters and 80% infill, which just feels like it's gonna be strong enough. I guess we'll find out. But the Y axis is built on an aluminum extrusion frame with 3D printed parts acting as the corner joints. A couple more chunky brackets connect the extrusions to the sliding gantry plate, which has more than enough insurance holes for beefing this thing up later if we need to. The Z carriage is gonna slide on these linear rails and will be mounted to this absolute unit of a 3D printed plate. Huge shout out to the P2S's bigger brother, the H2S, for allowing these massive parts to be printed. Look at how beautifully this thing slides. And of course, it's now time to test for strength. This is Mark and me putting the steezy in engine easy. <laughs> Shop Crocs and all. All right, enough funny business. Let's get back to work and start building the Z carriage, which is made up of four 20 by 20 aluminum extrusions, stiffened with, you guessed it, 3D printed brackets, and will be actuated by this 1200 millimeter ball screw. To cap it off, there's another very thick 3D printed plate. The Z tower gets mounted onto the linear sliders in the Y assembly, which is incredibly satisfying to move. After running a quick motor test, which by the way, this is the biggest motor I've ever used on a project to date, Mark and I hoisted the sliding assembly onto the wall and screwed it into the sliders on the gantry. We've got this thing up on the wall for the first time and the motor is wired. So we're gonna see this thing moving for the first time. Okay, so it's got power. So if I start turning this potentiometer, <laughs> what? Uh, oh, I gotta plug in the controller. Okay, so I have plugged in the microcontroller. Let's see if this works. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, yeah. Woo. Oh, it turns out you can actually hang from this thing. Check this out. Yeah. This thing is never gonna be carrying anything remotely as heavy as I am. The max weight it's gonna carry is like a drill. Can it handle a drill? Dude. At some point, every robot project eventually becomes a wiring project, and this one was no different. So we got this massive drag chain and fed a bunch of multi-conductor wires through it to power the motors, to power the gripper at the end of the Z-axis, and for the limit switches on each of the axes. You can see how the drag chain contains all the wires as the sliding end moves back and forth. We hoisted the drag chain onto the top of the shelving bins and connected the end to the sliding plate with the 3D printed bracket. That was totally not an afterthought. Fine, it was an afterthought. Thank you P2S for being lightning fast. And speaking of pre-planning, yeah, I forgot about this end here as well, but no worries. Thank you again to the P2S for being so fast. Very nice. While Mark took care of connecting all the ends of the wires to the respective connections on the sliding cart and threading the gripper power cable through the Z-axis extrusion, I put together this slightly janky but very functional CNC controller complete with three stepper drivers, a power supply, and an ESP32 driver. So now it is finally time to see how the Y and Z axes move. Just beautiful. 
Using a potentiometer as an input to jog the axes, you can see how smooth the Z-axis moves. The ball screw in combination with the linear rails is giving this seemingly effortless motion of the vertical carriage. The Y-axis, the Y-axis is a little crunchier, but upon closer inspection, you can see that the Y-axis carriage is actually moving quite smoothly as well. The belt tensioning system is working really well and the lead screws are moving in sync. And of course, with the Y and Z axis mounted, the X gantry still slides beautifully. <laughs> which means that we can move on to the final mechanical assembly, the gripper. The gripper is powered by a servo motor, which turns a pinion that drives the 3D printed parallel fingers in and out. But when I try to grab a bin, the fingers just slide right off the bin. So I added some sticky rubber pads to the fingertips. Perfect. I added two more servos and more 3D printed components to give the end effector assembly some more range of motion. But when I mounted it on a frame to do some testing, I ran into a bit of a problem when I was trying to grip onto heavier bins. I tried flipping the gripper to a horizontal position, but the bin was still slipping out. Before making any big modifications to any of the parts, I decided to add a couple screws to the tops of the fingers. These will be used to pull the drawers off the wall, but it turns out they can also be used to hold the bins as well. After adding some more weight, it seems to be holding. What about when I put what's probably the heaviest bin from the wall? She holds. The final step in the build is to attach the gripper assembly to the end of the Z axis. For now, I'm just gonna power it with the battery. All right, I've got the robot hooked up to this PS5 controller so I can now manually move it around. Let's see if I can manually pull a bin off the wall. Okay, so it's actually really fun controlling this thing manually, but I didn't come all this way to have like a remote control gantry cleaning system. I want this thing to clean automatically. So the next step is to get this thing doing some tasks automatically. First things first, we added some homing switches so the robot knows where it is on the wall. But testing this for the first time is super scary. We don't know whether this thing will like shoot itself off the end of the tracks or something. This is kind of one of those moments where it could go very right or very wrong. <laughs> okay, hit the button, hit the button. Oh, go the wrong way. Power, power, power. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Homing round two, Let's ready, see. go. Hey, okay. Be ready with that plug. So we need to stop when it hits this switch right here. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that worked. <laughs> so at home dax. We refined the speeds a bit, but now it repeats the process, homing Y to zero and Z to 945, which is its maximum position. Now we need some code to tell the controller how much a motor needs to move to move an axis to a specific point, which is different for each axis because when the X motor makes a full revolution, the gantry slides 117.75 millimeters. That's based on the size of the pinion that we're using. But the Y axis only moves two millimeters for a full revolution, which is based on the spacing of the threads on the lead screw known as the pitch. Z has a pitch of five millimeters. With that coded in, we could use this interface to start getting usable motion out of this thing, like X go to 2500, Y go to 66, and Z go to 647. And with that sorted out, it's finally time to see if we have achieved our goals for StuBot version one, starting with the bin test. All right, so I've created a database that maps all the bin locations on the wall. And then we've also connected this to my smart speaker. So I should be able to say, Echo, tell the studio bot to bring me the number four screws. But Stubot needs somewhere to put the bins. So we need one final 3D print, this landing zone with eight landing bays. Stubot knows the specific location of each bay. So let's say that there's seven more bins I specifically need for this project. I can say, Echo, tell Studio Bot to grab me the bins I need for this project. That is incredible, but we built this thing to clean up. So can it put these bins away? Echo, tell Studio Bot to put away my project bins. Tidying up project bins.
But what about all this clutter that's still on the desk? Echo, tell Studio about to tidy up. Tidying up too. So I was able to achieve my goals for version number one. It can pick bins from the wall and put them back, proving that we actually have one millimeter accuracy. And it can run this tool tidying routine. Of course, at the moment, these tools have been placed in pre-programmed spots, but the master plan is to improve on the entire system. It needs to be faster, and it needs to be truly automatic. That's all coming in future videos, but before we go, Stubot, I think you missed something. Ha <laughs> ha